All right, we're going to start where we left off at the end of the last video. If you haven't yet watched that one, go and do that now for some very important context and brownie points. Now that everyone still watching has already seen the first video, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, I'll start by reiterating the Clovis first Bering land bridge theory as it stood in 1967. It went as follows. During the last glacial maximum at the end of the Ice Age, all of Canada was buried under two large masses of glaciers. The first was the Laurentide Ice Sheet, originating over Hudson Bay and spreading east to the Atlantic and west to the foot of the Rockies, where it came in contact with the Cordillerian Ice Sheet that buried the Rockies to the Pacific Coast. Because of the mass of volume of water frozen in glaciers all over the world, sea levels were much lower than today, exposing Beringia, a stretch of land connecting Alaska with Far East Siberia. 15,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum ended and the ice sheets began to melt. This caused a rise in sea levels, burying Beringia by 12,000 years ago, permanently separating North America from Asia. But not before the Laurentide and Cordillerian glaciers receded from each other enough to form an ice-free corridor between them. This corridor allowed the Clovis people to pass from Siberia across Beringia into Alaska and then through Canada into the contiguous United States beginning 13,500 years ago, and over the next 600 years they astoundingly spread all over the United States into Central and even South America. All indigenous American peoples throughout the entire Western Hemisphere are descendants of this founding Clovis population. The Clovis people were also highly skilled hunters with a voracious appetite and a poor understanding of personal restraint, and in that half millennium of their expansion they managed to hunt all the Ice Age megafauna of the Americas to extinction. Vine Deloria Jr., renowned Lakota activist, scholar, and writer of Proceed with Caution Level Sharp Wit, I think perfectly summed the major problems that not a few people saw with this theory from the beginning. There's this perfect moment when the ice-free corridor magically appears just before the land bridge is covered by water. And the Paleo-Indians, who are doing fine in Siberia, suddenly decide to sprint over to Alaska. And then they sprint through the corridor, which just in time for them has been replenished with game. And they keep sprinting so fast that they overrun the hemisphere even faster than the Europeans did. And this even though they didn't have horses because they were so busy killing them all. And these archaeologists are the same people who say traditional origin tales are improbable. As I mentioned at the end of last video, there was already in 1967 a laundry list of potential pre-Clovis sites, and more were soon in coming. With characteristic brutality that would have made Erdlichka proud, Haynes and the other Clovis police systematically eviscerated all of these sites, sending many an embattled archaeologist into professional exile. One of the sites that died on Haynes' chopping block that really shouldn't have was Bluefish Caves in the northern Yukon. French-Canadian archaeologist Jacques Saint-Mars excavated the site between 1977 and 1987, and they found numerous artifacts that stood to not just rock, but absolutely capsize the Clovis boat. They found three categories of artifacts. First were stone blades belonging to the Siberian Dyukti tradition. This was a technological complex that lasted from about 18,000 to 10,000 years ago and can be found throughout Beringia, although they were relative latecomers to Bluefish Caves. Second were some bones that appeared to have possibly been worked into tools, though this was the most honestly debatable category that they found. Third, and most explosively, there were a few mammal bones preserved immaculately that showed very unambiguous signs of human butchery. Most famously was a horse jawbone with numerous parallel vertical cuts. Now, often it can be hard to tell whether cuts like these are anthropogenic or natural, but these were clearly anthropogenic. They're deep, regular, and most importantly, V-shaped, which is most consistent with the use of a blade. Teeth, claws, rocks, or sand all tend to produce U-shaped cuts. Recent analysis done within the last 10 years has pretty definitively demonstrated that these striations are in fact man-made. What was so offensive about this site was that the bone material was radiocarbon dated and found to be 24,000 years old, 10,000 years before Clovis. Now, mind you, 24,000 years ago was during the height of the last glacial maximum. The ice-free corridor wouldn't be open for a long time, and Bluefish Caves is on the wrong side of the ice. 
So human habitation at Bluefish honestly doesn't pose any threat to a Clovis first migration south of Canada. But nope, the Clovis crowd wasn't going to have it. Clovis were the first people to step foot anywhere in the Americas, and that was final. Sock Mars was laughed out of town and Bluefish Caves promptly forgotten for decades. And for no good reason, either. There was nothing wrong with the site. The evidence was very convincing, and Sock Mars' work had been meticulous. But everything was questioned anyway. The dates, the anthropogenic manufacture, Sock Mars' competence... No matter what he tried, the Clovis police just refused to take the site seriously, and Sock Mars was literally laughed out of conventions for years whenever he brought up the site. His dates were just too old for them to believe, so the site went nowhere. Bluefish Caves could have been up there as one of the linchpin sites responsible for dismantling the Clovis Bar, along with Meadowcroft and Monteverde, but unlike those two, it was just flat out not taken seriously. It wasn't until 2012, well after Sock Mars was dead, Bluefish had been forgotten, and the Clovis Bar already dismantled, that Loyan Bourgeon reanalyzed and redated the site with modern methods. She released her results in 2017, finding that the cuts were absolutely man made and that the 24,000 year old date was accurate. As of 2017, Bluefish Caves is the oldest proven site of human habitation in North America. But that's 2017. In the 1980s, it would take other sites to dismantle Clovis supremacy. The assault on the Clovis Castle really started in earnest in 1986 with, ironically enough, the publication of a landmark pro-Clovis paper. Linguist Joseph Greenberg, physical anthropologist Christy Turner, and geneticist Stephen Zagurin all teamed up in this paper to provide a range of Clovis-supporting evidence from fields outside of archaeology. Linguists had long noticed connections between North American and Siberian languages. However, many were highly skeptical of Clovis First's 13,000-year timeline, considering the extent of linguistic diversity in the Americas. In North America alone, there were as many as 300 distinct languages from six to eight separate linguistic stocks. These parent stocks are technically called phyla, though they're often just called families, which can get a tad bit confusing because there's a smaller unit of classification also called a family. So I'm just going to call them parent families. If that makes no sense to you, just don't worry about it. Rates of language evolution are by no means constant, they're highly variable, but we can say with almost damn near certainty that 13,000 years is in no way long enough to come up with eight parent families from one ancestor. To put that in perspective, Europe has been occupied for over 40,000 years and only developed four parent families. Joseph Greenberg simplified this problem by proposing that the Americas actually possesses only three parent families. Aleut, compromising the Arctic languages. Nadine, compromising languages present in far northwest Canada as well as the American Southwest. And Amerind, featuring everybody else. He asserted that this three-way linguistic split represents three waves of migration. Aleut was the youngest, arriving only around 2000 BC, Nadine was slightly older at around 7000 BC, and Amarin the oldest, arriving just a bit over 11,000 BC. Christy Turner echoed this three-wave migration theory by analyzing teeth morphology. Now, all humans have the same number and type of teeth, however, those teeth can differ in very subtle but detectable ways along certain ethnic lines. Turner analyzed 28 traits on some over 200,000 indigenous teeth and came to the same groupings as Greenberg. Now, these featural differences give no evolutionary advantage, hence they're assumed to be random mutations which occur at a constant rate. Turner compared these indigenous teeth with East Asian teeth to establish a timeline of migration, and surprise, surprise, also came to about the same time frames as Greenberg. The geneticist Steven Zagurin, providing an inkling of contrariety, did state that from a molecular biology perspective, quote, a tripartite division of modern Native Americans is still without strong confirmation, end quote. He did, however, assert that there was a high level of genetic homogeneity across indigenous American populations, all showing very similar genetic mutations. 
This suggests a very small founder population, possibly around 1,000 individuals or less, which is precisely in line with typical Clovis doctrine. Now, these claims were wild, and they were wildly unpopular. The Clovis hardliners loved it, to be sure, but everyone else was absolutely baffled. The entire field of American linguistics was particularly gobsmacked. A sampling of statements from linguists on the matter goes something to the order of superficial, specious, a vacuous hypothesis, and my personal favorite, <laughs> somewhere between zero and hopeless. <laughs> wow, that's harsh. To make a long story short-ish, the claims this paper made were absolutely not supported by any evidence whatsoever, and the paper sparked waves of rebuttal studies demonstrating its gaping flaws. This was important because all this new research added to our understanding of the late Ice Age world, especially in the field of genetics. Okay, this is going to require a brief intro into genetics. You can trace genetic lineage through two methods. Paternal Y-chromosome DNA, which fathers pass on to their sons but not their daughters, or maternal mitochondrial DNA, which mothers pass to both their daughters and their sons, but only the daughters will continue to pass it on. DNA mutates over time, and these mutations create patterns which scientists can group together into a classification called a haplogroup. As mutations continue, new patterns emerge which define new haplogroups. These mutations usually occur at constant rates, so you can use these mutations to trace a timeline of when, and to a certain extent where, haplogroups split off from one another, and thereby get a picture of human migration. The rate of mutation is different between mitochondrial and Y-DNA, so you'll have two separate types of haplogroup, Y-haplogroups and mitochondrial haplogroups. For reasons that are above my pay grade, mitochondrial DNA was easier to study and therefore sequenced first. Now, I want to make one thing very clear. Genetics is a very complicated and messy field, and the more we learn about it, the more complicated it gets. A haplogroup does not correspond to a racial group. Race, as traditionally understood in the West, is entirely a function of phenotypic features. Things like skin color, hair color, facial and skull structure, etc. These things are genetically determined, but not by the patterns and mutation that define haplogroups. Consequently, it is very common for haplogroups to cross boundaries of race and phenotypic differences. To give you a good example, the R1B paternal haplogroup is the dominant haplogroup among white Western Europeans. You know where it's also very common? Among West Africans, who are most certainly not white. As we'll see later in the video, this divide between Western notions of race and the realities of genetics has proven to be a frequent stumbling block for people looking to rewrite the story of American antiquity. In 1990, a landmark study mapped the mitochondrial DNA of the indigenous American genome. Indeed, displaying a remarkable level of, my, of genetic homogeneity, it was found that all indigenous DNA from across the Americas can be placed into five haplogroups, just four of which comprised 96.9% of this DNA. These four were very creatively named A, B, C, and you're never going to guess, D. It's D. A, C, and D are common in northern Siberia. B is almost entirely absent in Siberia, but present in every indigenous American. None of these four haplogroups are present anywhere in Australia, Africa, or Europe. Three other haplogroups made up the remaining 3.9% of DNA. Haplogroups L, which is common in Europe, and H, which is common in Africa, can be accounted for by post-contact admixture, which is why I didn't count them in the aforementioned five. Haplogroup X is a bit of an oddball. It's present in scattered populations around North America, as distant as the Anishinaabe of the Midwest, the Bellacula of the Pacific Northwest, and the Zuni of the Southwest, but nowhere in South America, and it's also present in Europe and India. We'll be revisiting X later. Originally, these results were seen as confirming the three-wave migration theory out of Siberia, with the largest haplogroup interpreted as being the Clovis haplogroup. The fact that the dates given for departure from Asia stretched back at least 25,000 years 
was seen by Clovis-loving archaeologists as just the imprecise nature of genetics compared to the more hard science of archaeology. A subsequent genetic study of A, C, and D haplogroups, the ones present in both America and Siberia, preserved this three-wave hypothesis but pushed the departure date back another 5,000 years. A 97 study by two Brazilian geneticists, Sandra Bonato and Francisco Bolsano, focused on haplogroup B, the one nearly absent from Siberia. Because this haplogroup is present in every indigenous American, the multiple route theory had to tap on an awkward corollary that a small population of haplogroup B members was present in every wave of migration. For some reason, they decided to come over three times instead of just once. Bonato and Bolsano thought a single migration much more likely and calculated a haplogroup B departure date of 33,000 to 43,000 years ago. Once in Beringia, the group split, with one branch going south before the last glacial maximum and the other staying in Beringia until after the ice-free corridor opened back up again. At this point, they migrated south in one to two waves. In their assessment, there was only one wave out of Asia, but two to three waves out of Beringia. This model has gained more traction among geneticists, though not universally, and with 20 years of research and modification, has morphed into the modern Bering standstill hypothesis. As alluded to before, amongst archaeologists, at least back then, and especially amongst Clovis Firsters, there was very much a sense of genetics and even linguistics not being as precise a science as archaeology. They were happy to lean on genetic research when it threw them a bone and discard it when it threw them a monkey wrench. If the challenges to Clovis primacy were going to have any impact, they were going to have to come from within the field of archaeology. Meadowcroft Rock Shelter is an unassuming little site about 30 miles southeast of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. Led by James Adavazio, author of one of my source books, it was first excavated from 1973 to 1979 and has seen waves of subsequent excavations all the way to the present day. What was found there was the first evidence to seriously challenge the Clovis Bar that couldn't be laughed away or ignored the way Bluefish Caves was. Arvazio was meticulous from the beginning. The excavation had broad and unwavering financial support from donors, so they had the fortune of being able to take their time. And take it they did. Still today, Meadowcroft is widely regarded as one of, if not the most, carefully excavated sites in all of North America. Haynes himself visited Meadowcroft early on in the excavation and called the work, quote, unexceptionable, with, quote, no holes in the data. He very swiftly walked back those words once certain items were dated. The top layers contained items as recent as the late colonial period, and the deeper they dug, the further back they went, continuously finding evidence of human habitation. Into the Woodland period, the Archaic period, and even the Clovis period. Still digging, they found a new collection of stone tools in a layer deeper than Clovis. This was an entirely separate tool tradition which bore no resemblance to the Folsom or Clovis kits. New types of knives, gravers, scrapers, etc. Dating the tools came out with the impossible age of 16,000 years ago. At the time, Meadowcroft showed the longest continuous human habitation of any site in all the Americas. Deeper layers contained biological material, but no evidence of human habitation that stretched back another 15,000 years. Arvazio knew exactly what it meant to publish dates like this, and the reaction was exactly as he expected. The human manufacture of the tools wasn't really in question, that was pretty apparent, but the specter of contamination in the radiocarbon dates was raised from the very beginning, and kept getting raised for decades. Adavazio had sent the samples to the Oxford Radiocarbon Dating Facility in England, one of the preeminent radiocarbon dating labs in the world. They attested that there was absolutely, positively, no contamination whatsoever in the sample, and still the Clovis firsters weren't satisfied. They demanded more dates from other labs, and when those dates showed the same results, oh, they really got creative. Suspected sources of contamination ranged from local anthracite coal common in Pennsylvania to vitrinized wood, groundwater seepage, classic layer mixing, you name it. This is where Adavazio's painstaking precision came in clutch because he was able to refute, with evidence from the site, 
every single one of these claims. It's worth noting that, except for one person, nobody questioned the Clovis and post-Clovis samples, nor the pre-16,000 uninhabited samples. Somehow, it was only the pre-Clovis habitation samples that had gotten contaminated. Because that makes sense. And remember, all of these different samples were being tested by the same labs. Aside from the Clovis drama, Meadowcroft is also noticeable for the insight it's given us to the late Ice Age ecosystem. The site yielded the largest haul of floral and faunal materials of any site in the eastern U.S., over 2 million samples, providing an exceptional window into the environmental changes over the last 30,000 years. At the height of the last glacier maximum, Meadowcroft sat less than 50 miles south from the glacier's southern edge. At the time, the environment that near the ice was expected to have been barren and inhospitable, at best reminiscent of far northern tundra. The picture we got from Meadowcroft demonstrated a landscape that was much more lush and habitable than previously thought. Findings that were not without their own controversy. The Clovis Firsters really had a paramount ability not just to come up with crazy bullshit to question a site, but to do it convincingly enough to keep a site in limbo for years. But no matter how hard they tried, they couldn't push Meadowcroft out of the conversation entirely. Unfortunately, however, one site wasn't going to be enough to crack the Clovis Dam. It would take others. That honor, or misfortune, fell to Tom Dillahay and the Monte Verde site. Monte Verde sits in south-central Chile, way down in northern Patagonia, and from 1977 to 1985, Dillahay and his partner Mario Pino led an excavation. Their findings were published in two massive works, the first in 1989 and the second nine years later in 1997. Like in Metercroft, it's seen numerous subsequent excavations up to the present day. The Monte Verde site is absolutely unique in American archaeology because it's what's called a wet site. At some point in the distant past, it was covered over by a peat bog, and the wet but anaerobic environment allowed for pristine preservation of organic materials. These types of sites are very common in Northern Europe, but very rare in the Americas. The site consisted of an animal hide tent structure tied to a wooden frame with plant fiber rope, and all of these components were preserved. One of the most famous finds was a wooden stake with a piece of rope literally tied around it. Several clay hearths lay scattered around the structure, one of which had a human footprint in it. There were numerous seed and plant remains, bones with signs of butchery, even human hair, and a new set of stone tools completely unrelated to Clovis. The site was perfectly situated to take advantage of local resources. It was about a day's walk from the ocean in one direction and the mountains in another, and it was clear that the inhabitants were accessing both. Their diet was found to be mostly seafood, complemented with red meat, and they were also eating wild potatoes, several thousand years before their domestication. About a third of their tools were made from non-local stone, and they were using several medicinal plants that are still in use by inhabitants of the region today. What's more, the site showed areas of specialization. There was one location where game was butchered, a second location where food was prepped, another location where tools were crafted, etc. Two things were very clear. It was evident that this was not just a temporary camp of nomads. This was a sedentary village where at least some population of people lived nearly or fully year-round. Likewise, it was clear that these were no recent arrivals. Everything about their lifestyle and material culture was intimately adapted to the local environment. These were people who'd been here for quite some time. So it was quite a shock when the first radiocarbon dates came back from the lab. The earliest dates showed occupation in Monte Verde at least 12,800 years ago. Now, this wasn't a pre-Clovis date, but everybody agreed that there was no way in hell Clovis could have walked over land from Alaska to Patagonia in less than a thousand years. Arvazio sums the situation quite well. 
This meant that serious archaeologists had to swallow the idea of proliferating bands of hunters and their families trotting south 10 to 20 miles a day, charging through deserts and tangled forests, pausing for fleeting moments to mow down the big mammals that got in the way, bolting down hundreds of pounds of meat, racing over mountain pashes, splashing through rivers, breastfeeding babies on the run, leapfrogging whole regions, desperately seeking... what? Some mystical, mythical destination they knew lay south? Subsequent analysis pushed the date of habitation back to between 18,500 and 14,500 years ago, making Monteverde a firmly pre-Clovis site. Pino, de la Haye's colleague, alleges a date as far back as 32,000 years ago based on a sample from a charred piece of wood. However, as we've already explored, it's very difficult to tell if that wood was indeed burned in a human fireplace or just a natural forest fire. Dillahay himself, along with most others, was, and still is, skeptical about this law. Even the more reliable dates, though, were just too much for the Clovis crowd, and they descended on Monteverde with vicious brutality. As much as they'd eviscerated other archaeologists, they crucified Dillahay. Again, the anthropogenic manufacturer of the stone tools wasn't really up for debate, but literally everything else was. The stratigraphy was questioned, contamination was alleged, Dillahay's competence was assaulted. It got so bad and so personal, professional archaeologists were writing letters to his university trying to get him fired. Some people in both North and South America even accused him of being a CIA agent. Dillahay would later state, quote, People refused to shake my hand at meetings. It was like I was killing their children. He has told numerous of his colleagues that, quote, If he had to do it all over again, he wouldn't. It hasn't been worth the agony. Despite the virulent personal assaults, Dillahay and his team stuck to their guns and defended every claim. In 1997, a group of archaeological bigwigs, including Haynes and Otavazio, flew down and toured the site. Haynes was so ridiculous as to question that the footprint and even the tied rope were authentically human, to which Delhay and Otavazio just responded with blank stares. Despite the Clovisite skepticism, most on the trip were tenuously convinced and released a statement to that effect. Haynes and the Clovis Firsters continued to concoct every conceivable excuse to uphold their sacred cow, but by now the damage was done. A slim majority of academics emerged, admitting the Clovis bar was no longer tenable. The Clovis crowd was now a minority, and as time passed and more and more pre-Clovis sites were discovered, their numbers dwindled, though painstakingly slowly. Even to this day, they still continue to have extremely vocal adherence. Other critical components of the Clovis first model had by now also amassed serious challenges. Much of the juice fueling Haynes' original theory relied heavily on the timing of the ice-free corridor. Considering that the Clovis model absolutely refuses the possibility of a sea route crossing, if the corridor isn't open just before Clovis arrives, the whole theory falls apart. It used to be thought that the Canadian glaciers were one solid mass of ice for most of the last 50,000 years or more, only splitting apart after the end of the last glacial maximum. Nowadays, we have precisely the opposite image. For most of the last 50,000 years, the corridor was open. It was instead only during the last glacial maximum from about 26,000 to 19,000 years ago that it was closed. This means a pre-LGM crossing is theoretically feasible. As far as when the corridor reopened, that has been the scene of vigorous debate. In the 80s, one model was published pushing the opening date up to 12,000 years ago, a serious challenge to the Clovis model. Others have pushed it back as far as nearly 17,000 years ago, also unacceptable to Clovis firsters because that allows time for someone to slip in before Clovis. Climate and ecology specialists chimed in that even if the corridor opened up at the magical 14,000-year date, the landscape would have been utterly inhospitable. It's not enough for the corridor to simply be open. Plant and animal species need to have filled it with enough food for a migrating band of humans not to starve during the crossing. Ecologists complained that process alone would have taken several hundred years. 
The newest research as of 2022 points to a reopening date of 13,800 years ago. This is early enough for a Clovis land crossing, ecologists' concerns notwithstanding, but not early enough for pre-Clovis sites like Meadowcroft. Another side of the theory that ecologists had significant problems with was the overkill hypothesis. If humans had ruthlessly hunted the megafauna, why not all large mammals? Why had they slaughtered the cave bear but not the grizzly bear? Why was the bison antiquus not spared when its smaller cousin bison bison was? Why did the horses die out, but not the elk? Furthermore, there were numerous species of small mammals and shellfish that died, too. If it was all the result of human overhunting, why such a selective spread of extinctions? Overkill was also highly dependent on timeline. If the megafauna died out in any more than just the narrow time frame after Clovis' arrival, it falls apart. And subsequent refinements in radiocarbon dating proved just that. Rather than a mass extinction of 60-plus species in the 600 years of Clovis habitation, it was shown that the extinctions occurred on a much more gradual timescale, lasting from 17,000 to 9,000 years ago. There was a spike around the Clovis time frame, but many extinctions had begun well before then and would continue long afterwards. As the discovery of pre-Clovis sites pushed the date of human habitation back further, the image that arose was one of humans and any given species of megafauna coexisting for several thousand years before that species went extinct. Not exactly what you'd expect to see in an anthropogenic extinction event. What's more, the increasing archaeological evidence didn't reflect homicidal-level hunting patterns at all. Archaeologists Meltzer and Grayson conducted a survey of 76 Paleo-Indian sites throughout the U.S. They found evidence of big game hunting in just 14 of these sites, and all of it only of two species, Mastodon and Bison. If humans hunted over 60 species to extinction, where are the remains? These two would later comment, quote, The overkill hypothesis lives on, not because of archaeologists and paleontologists who are experts in the area, but because it keeps getting repeated by those who are not. So where does this leave us now? Well, admittedly, with a much more complicated picture than the Clovis crowd would care for. Everything that I am about to say is subject to change, as these topics are constantly the items of new research. This portion of the video could be completely outdated in a year or two. As mentioned, numerous other pre-Clovis sites found throughout the Americas have firmly established a human presence on the continent well before 13,500 years ago. These include Cactus Hill, Virginia, home to 16,000-year-old tools, Huaca Prieta on the Peruvian coast, home to 14,500-year-old tools, Galt in Texas, also around 16,000 years old, and many, many others. Galt is most notable not for its pre-Clovis elements, but because it held an absolutely massive haul of Clovis tools. Over 50% of all Clovis artifacts to date came from just Galt. As already mentioned, in 2017, Bluefish Caves was restored to its rightful place as a pre-Clovis site, dating to 24,000 years ago, making it the oldest reliably dated site in the hemisphere. And most recently in 2021, fossilized footprints were found in White Sands National Park, New Mexico, dating to 23,000 years ago, making this the oldest reliably dated site south of Canada. One site that has been in the news in the last few years is Chiquihuite Caves in Mexico. There, what are claimed to be stone tools were found dating to around 30,000 years ago. If true, this would push the bar even further. However, the jury is still out on this one, and personally, the evidence does not look very convincing. I'll drop a link in the description to a video on Nathaniel Faustin's channel. He's an actual pre-Columbian archaeologist. I'll let you check out what he thinks, but my opinion was formed by his opinion. As far as how these pre-Clovis people got around the glaciers, well, now we can finally return to the original topic of this video, an analysis of the Bering Land Bridge theory. The fact that the corridor could have been passable before the last glacial maximum means that a strictly land route is theoretically possible. People could have passed through Canada before 26,000 years ago, stopped for the next 13,000 years, then continued migrating south again. This sort of 13,000-year lowland migration would almost certainly show up in the genetic record. 
Indeed, there are geneticists who propose just this sort of division. However, there are also others who opt for a more steady trickle model of migration, and yet others who propose a two- to three-way split like this, but don't advocate a pre-LGM crossing. Genetics is probably the field with the most disagreement right now regarding indigenous American migration patterns. One theory that has gained a lot of traction in recent years, and to which I am admittedly partial, is the coastal migration theory. While the corridor through Canada was covered in ice for over 10,000 years, afterwards needing to be repopulated with plants and animals before any humans could survive in the region, our most recent research suggests that the Pacific coast was a much more hospitable place for the entirety of the last 30,000 years. There were certainly areas where the glaciers came right up to the water's edge, but we have strong evidence that there were always pockets of inhabitable ice-free land scattered along the coast refuges of habitation among the glaciers. Many of these supported healthy enough ecosystems to feature populations of large mammals like deer and even bear, and what's more, this stretch of ocean is a veritable supermarket. We have every bit of evidence that then, as now, the North Pacific was home to no shortage of marine resources. Marine mammals like seal and otters, shellfish, fish, kelp, etc., Unlike the barren interior corridor, a coastal migration channel was never without abundant food. We know that ocean-going vessels were used to populate Australia, Melanesia, and Japan as far back as 40,000 years ago, so it's entirely possible that Siberians sailed north, hugging the coastline, and island hopped through the refuges to get past the glaciers. For most of human history, watercraft have proved by far the most efficient mode of transportation. One archaeologist had noted, quote, even primitive boats could traverse the entire Pacific coast of North and South America in less than 10 to 15 years. Now, the major problem with this theory is the lack of material evidence. All sites that would have been right along the coast 20,000 years ago are now underwater. It may make good intuitive sense, and we may have good evidence that it was possible, but without finding real physical evidence, we can't say with certainty that anyone actually took this route. Consequently, much attention is being paid to try and find said evidence, even though it means looking on the seafloor. Now that there is no longer one dominant and very tidy theory of Paleo-Indian migration, there has been a proliferation of, shall we say, very unconventional theories, almost entirely being suggested by non-professionals, that range from the novel but far-fetched to the crackpot and downright racist. This category of theory has always been a feature in ancient American studies, but has definitely seen an uptick in the last 40 years. First, let's talk the Polynesian connection. This one's honestly pretty innocuous, so we'll just get it out of the way. There are some voices who suggest the possibility of a South Pacific crossing to South America. They mostly base this on three lines of evidence. First, there are a few Paleo-Indian remains that some people think have rather Polynesian phenotypic features. Second, there is a tantalizing, though extremely small, suggestion of ancient Polynesian DNA in South America. And finally, we know that Polynesians did traverse the entire Pacific Ocean, so maybe their ancestors could have done the same. First, all the Polynesian-looking remains that we've genetically tested show no Polynesian connection. They are most closely genetically related to modern indigenous Americans who are largely descended from Siberians demonstrating that phenotypics and genetics are not a perfect comparison. Secondly, the genetic suggestion of Polynesian DNA in South America doesn't necessarily mean a straight-line crossing from the South Pacific to South America. This is what many lay people misunderstand about genetics. A genetic link between two groups does not mean there is a direct connection between those two groups. More often than not, they are both descendants of a common ancestor but they may never have come in contact with each other. All of the modern people groups who populate the islands of Oceania, Melanesians, Micronesians, and Polynesians, are descended from a founder population that lived on Taiwan. This founder population eventually sailed south and east, and their descendants settled the whole Pacific. It's entirely possible that a portion of that founder population, or even some of that population's own ancestors, sailed in the opposite direction going north and following the same route as the Siberians across the North Pacific, bringing their genetic signature with them, though not sailing through the South Pacific to do so. 
Finally, just because the Polynesians of the seafaring chops to make a Pacific crossing a thousand years ago in no way means their ancestors 20,000 years before had the same chops. Hugging the coastline and sailing straight into the open blue are two very different things. And what's more, these sailors would have had to stop occasionally to reprovision, and we have no archaeological evidence of habitation on any South Pacific island that long ago. Sure, the sea levels rose and could have buried archaeological sites, but people living on a tiny island don't just stay right on the shoreline. They would almost certainly have ventured inland where any remains they left would be preserved. You could point out that there are multiple islands throughout the Pacific that were entirely submerged by the rising sea levels and that they could have stopped there, but unless we're suggesting that they only stopped on the islands that were conveniently buried by the ocean and no others, we should see evidence somewhere. Like I said, I find this theory rather benign. My only problem with it is the lack of good evidence. I had half a mind to cut this segment, but I kept it in because it's part of the conversation. There are other theories, though, that are not benign at all, and that I very much want to debunk. A common trend we'll see with these theories is the reliance on unreliable phenotypical evidence. Many, but not all, of the oldest indigenous remains we found do look a little different when compared to modern indigenous Americans. As we've discussed earlier, though, genetics do not respect Western notions of race. There have been several Paleo-Indian remains discovered that appear to sport phenotypic features somewhat different from modern indigenous Americans. These include Naya from the Yucatan, Lucia and other Lagoa Santa remains from Brazil, and Kennewick Man from Washington, among others. Their bone structures just don't look quite right. This has led some people to suggest that they are in fact not related to modern indigenous Americans, but are instead of a separate racial group from a separate ancestry who populated the continent before the arrival of modern indigenous peoples. The usual suggestion being, of course, that they are Europeans. Hmm. Two separate races of people living on the continent. Where, oh where, have I heard that one before? That's right. It's the Mound Builder 2 race theory all over again, this time repackaged as an Ice Age 2 race theory. Colonizers are always going to come up with some reason to undermine indigenous connections and rights to their land in order to justify colonization, murder, and theft of that Indian land. Make no mistake, that's what theories like this are intended to do strengthen the white claim to Indian land, and erode the Indian claim to Indian land. And if you think I'm reading between lines that don't exist, these arguments and these theories get brought up in actual public discourse on these topics, as happened with Kennewick Man. I will absolutely make a full video on this later because it's a story worth telling on its own. In 1996, bone remains were discovered along the shores of the Columbia River near Kennewick, Washington. The police were called, who then called a private anthropological consultant. He first assumed them to be remains of a white settler, but upon further examination, found they had to be much older. There appeared to be a remnant of a spear tip lodged in his hip of a type that hadn't been manufactured for four to five thousand years. Unscrewing his head from his neck and sticking it up his ass, he conducted a sloppy examination before shooting his mouth off to the local press that it was a, quote, Caucasoid skeleton most closely resembling that of an early modern European. And with that, the news went national. It was subsequently radiocarbon dated and found to be around 9,000 years old, making it one of the oldest bodies found in the Americas. It was also one of the most complete ancient skeletons ever found. Overnight, every white supremacist on the goddamn continent was worshipping at the altar of Kennewick Man. An Aryan group known as the Asatru Folk Assembly threatened to sue the U.S. government for the return of their ancestor. Colonizers all over screamed that Kennewick Man was proof white people had been in America before Indians and that therefore indigenous people had no right to the land they lived on. It was a racist mess, but it was also a professional mess too. The Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, NAGPRA, had recently been passed in 1990. 
Lots of archaeologists hated it because, for the first time, they were now legally required to, at least to a certain extent, listen to the wishes of indigenous people regarding their own artifacts and human remains. Such a travesty. NAGPRA provided a mechanism for tribes to request the return of remains and artifacts hoarded in museums and any new ones discovered. However, it was very clearly designed to deal with more colonial age artifacts as it required a tribe making a NAGPRA claim to furnish proof that the artifact in question was theirs specifically. Something very hard to do with remains as old as Kennewick Man. The Umatilla tribe in Oregon, the closest tribe to where Kennewick Man was found, made a NAGPRA claim for the return of Kennewick Man's body. Archaeologists wanted the body for research. Understandably, given the racist mess that was now engulfing Indian country and the role that a sloppy scientist had in unleashing that mess, the tribe was very eager to return Kennewick Man to the ground, and it didn't trust archaeologists to handle him properly. The whole incident turned into a quagmire that it didn't need to, with many in the public and academia accusing Indians of being ignorant and anti-science, while many in Indian country were reeling from the pain of another episode of racist colonialist vitriol. The incident has severely impacted indigenous relations with the archaeological community, even to the present day. Kennewick Man was stuck in legal limbo before finally being reburied in 2017. Some research was able to be done on him in the meantime. In the early 2000s, scientists at the Interior Department were able to more carefully analyze the body and conclude that he was not, in fact, a pasty white European, but most closely resembled skeletal structures found in Polynesians or the Ainu of northern Japan. Genetic research in 2015 concluded Kennewick Man is, in fact, 100% Indigenous American. His paternal haplogroup is QM3 and his mitochondrial X2A, both haplogroups found exclusively in the Americas. Yes, that's right, Kennewick Man has the weird X haplogroup that I mentioned before. As I said back then, when we first discovered the X haplogroup in the 80s and 90s, it appeared to be quite an oddball being found in Europe, India, and scattered around North America. You can probably guess that some people use this as evidence to suggest a European migration to the Americas. The fact that the X haplogroup is one of the rarest haplogroups in the Americas was used to suggest that it's the remnant of an ancient European population who is displaced by waves of modern American Indian migration. However, genetics has come a long way since then, and many of the major haplogroups of old have been further subdivided into smaller distinctions. Through research, we've been able to demonstrate that the variant of X found in North America, named X2A, is exclusive to North America. Europe contains several different strands of the X haplogroup, but most importantly, none of them are ancestral to the X2A of North America. They all share common ancestry to an older variant of X that was present in Central Asia, from which it seems the population split some going west into Europe, and the rest going east into Siberia and on to the Americas. There's another haplogroup with this same story, the R1b paternal haplogroup. As I mentioned before, R1b is very common in Western Europe. It is also very common in northeastern North America. Again, a direct connection has been proposed. However, R1b is also found scattered across the entirety of Russia, stretching to the far east, and we've traced R1b's ancestry to a founder population also in Central Asia. This is an honestly even more picture than X of the Central Asian population splitting, with some moving west and others east. Kennewick Man is a very clear example of the ways that phenotypical features can change over time in ways that are completely unrelated to one's genetic haplogroup. And the more we learn, the more common cases like Kennewick Man have become. We now understand that these phenotypical changes can be pretty dramatic and pretty quick with no perceptible impact on the genetics of one's haplogroup. Thus, phenotypical features are very unreliable sources of information when attempting to trace patterns of human migration. The most influential European crossing theory that keeps popping up time and time again is the Salutrian hypothesis. It's been proposed on numerous occasions all the way back to the 1870s, but the most recent iteration is the work of Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley since the 90s. 
The theory goes that people from the Salutrian culture of southeastern France and the Iberian Peninsula sailed across the North Atlantic 21,000 years ago and became the progenitors of the Clovis culture. The theory rests on two main sources of evidence. First, there are perceived similarities between Salutrian tools and Clovis tools, and secondly, the vast majority of Clovis sites are found in eastern North America, suggesting, according to the hypothesis, a population diffusion from east to west rather than west to east. There are countless problems with this theory, and virtually no credible geneticist, linguist, archaeologist, or anthropologist thinks it has any merit. But that has not stopped the theory from being parroted in the media and infecting popular culture. So let's talk about it. First off, looking at population density and concluding that that is a reflection of age of habitation makes the critical error of overlooking the impact of natural resources. Simply put, there's more food in the eastern United States than the west, and that's why you see larger populations in the east. More food equals more people. Less food equals less people. It's a very simple equation. Secondly, according to actual specialists in Salutrian archaeology, the connection between Salutrian tools and Clovis tools is superficial at best. The real diagnostic features that define Salutrian and Clovis tools are profoundly different. Salutrian theorists claim that pre-Clovis toolkits of the eastern woodlands form a transition period between Salutrian and Clovis kits, but again, specialists of both Salutrian and Clovis tools find no credible similarities between either kits and the proposed transitional cultures. The factors that really condemn the theory have to do with the route of transportation. The Salutrians were clearly seafarers, but we have no evidence of them utilizing deep ocean resources or having the seafaring capabilities necessary for an Atlantic crossing. Thus, they would have had to cross on foot. It used to be thought that the glaciers in the North Atlantic formed a solid and stable wall from Europe to North America that the Salutrians could easily have just walked over. However, our picture nowadays is very different. The ice only advanced enough to connect the two continents for three months out of the year, in the dead of winter. For the rest of the year, the water was open. Thus, the Salutrians would have had to bolt across the ice in the thick of the Ice Age winter every year. And unlike the Pacific coast of North America, there weren't several glacier-free pockets of land close to one another to hop between. They would have had to travel to Britain, then race from Britain to Iceland with nowhere to stop in between in three months, then from Iceland to Greenland again with no break in three months the whole time not falling through into the glacially cold North Atlantic. Also, what were they eating during these crossings? Iceberg fields like this are not the preferred habitat of any sea mammal. Even if they did have the seafaring chops to sail across, which again we have no evidence for, the North Atlantic at this time was absolutely choked with roaming icebergs. The sort of icebergs that sank the Titanic. And the currents would have carried them right into the Salutrian's path so they would have had to avoid them day and night of sailing. Not to mention, we have no archaeological evidence of Salutrian habitation in Britain, Iceland, or Greenland, nor any genetic evidence of a European population in North America. Now, it's possible that they all died out and left no genetic signature, but you're really going to tell me that the Salutrians were in America for almost 10,000 years, crafted the Clovis Point and spreader across the entire continent, and then just died without a trace? The evidence for the Salutrian hypothesis just doesn't exist, and yet it persists. Why? Well, it persists for the same reasons that the American public was thirsty and eager to accept the idea of a Caucasian Kennewick man. It persists for the same reason the Clovis Bar and Overkill captivated not just the public, but professional academics and caused them to throw their professional objectivity out the window in favor of dogmatically preserving a belief with more fervor and devotion than a religion. It persists for the same reasons that some scientists absolutely could not believe indigenous habitation stretched back further than a few thousand years, and for the same reasons that it was universally accepted modern indigenous peoples couldn't have built the monumental structures that they did because non-Indigenous Americans don't want to believe Indigenous societies on this continent are that old and that sophisticated. The whole story of Euro-American thought regarding original habitation of the Americas is this one long tale of Westerners trying to justify colonialism. 
There's certainly a sector of the American population, we've learned in recent years, a much larger sector than we'd care to admit, that still holds a disgusting level of straight-up racism towards indigenous peoples. For them, the idea of another white population being the real progenitors of indigenous cultures is very appealing because they just straight up don't believe indigenous people capable of building their own responsible societies. The overkill hypothesis tapped into this same nerve. An interview between Charles Mann, author of 1491, and an Esqually man named Denny addresses just this. As the environmental movement gathered steam in the 1960s, he said white people had discovered that Indians were better stewards of the land. Indigenous people were superior to them. Horrors! The Archies, that's what Denny called the archaeologists, had to race in and rescue Caucasian self-esteem, which they did with the ridiculous conceit that Indians had been the authors of an ecological mega-disaster. Typical, Denny thought. In his view, archaeologists' main function was to make white people feel good about themselves. An opinion that archaeologists have learned to their cost is not Denny's alone. There's another segment of people, though, who are motivated by a desire to just ignore this country's colonial past. The doctrine of discovery that permitted Western colonization of the Americas, and which numerous U.S. court cases have recognized is still the foundation of U.S. law and legal legitimacy on the American continent, was predicated on the idea of terra nullius, empty land. The idea that the continent was completely devoid of people and thus open for European colonization. Of course, the land wasn't empty. There were people here, and Europeans justified this discrepancy by categorizing Indians as either not people at all or not civilized enough to deserve being treated like people. Thus, centuries of pillage, rape, murder, theft, and genocide were all justified by the idea that indigenous societies weren't sophisticated enough to be considered worthy of existence. The more and more we learn about indigenous history in the Americas, the more and more this terra nullius perspective is exposed for the racist trash it is. Indigenous societies were sophisticated, and they've been here for a very long time. The more developed, large, and old indigenous societies were at the time of colonization, the less and less American history is a story of our ancestors settling an uninhabited wilderness open for the taking, and the more and more it's a story of our ancestors violently uprooting entrenched and ancient civilizations and replacing them with their own. For all but the most ardent racists, this is an image that can't just be comfortably ignored. So we stuff it down. We try to believe anything else. We grasp at straws and cling to them for dear life. We love the idea that Indians are recent arrivals. We chase the idea that Indians are settlers and colonizers just like us, and that we too have an ancestral claim to this land. We emphatically embrace the idea that Indians are irresponsible stewards of their resources, and that for the sake of humanity and nature alike, it's best that if we white people take the lead on resource management. We will believe anything, anything if it means not confronting the fact that the land you and I live on was stolen for no reason better than greed, that this theft deserves justice, and that justice for our country's past injustices is possible. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode and this exploration through the rich and storied history of our perceptions of human migration in the Americas. If you like this content and want to keep watching, please do like, subscribe, and hit that notification button to stay in the loop, and I will see you next time.